Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. It seems like to me, as I've just been sitting here thinking about the Word of God and what I'm going to talk about today, that everything that we have talked about in Matthew 24 really is leading up to this one event. You know, Matthew 24, he talks about wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, wars everywhere. People are getting, going to be killed. They're going to deliver people up to be afflicted. God's saints. There's going to be earthquakes and famines and pestilences and stuff falling out of the sky everywhere. And it's all leading up the false prophets. Can't leave that out because we probably didn't even scratch the surface of dealing with false prophets, false teachers, false doctrines, false Bibles, false books, liars, YouTube videos, you name it. But all of that, and, and I think especially the false prophets, leading up to this one event. You remember when we did the study of King Manasseh. King Manasseh was one of the last kings of Judah. And if you remember 2 Chronicles 33, Manasseh was only 12 years old when he started, when he became king, and he was very early on already being led into the study of witchcraft, sorcery, the occult, uh, worshiping other gods. He knew more about other gods than he knew about his creator God. And it listed these 13 things that he did. And I made a series of that, talking about the 13 things Manasseh did, which led to the 14th thing. He, you know, had his children burned in the fire, you know, going through the fire to Moloch, in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and he did enchantments and wizardry and all this stuff. And then the 14th thing he did, he set a carved image, the idol which he made in the house of God. No other king before him had done that. It didn't happen, never happened in Moses' time. The high priest Aaron, Moses' brother, was only allowed to go into the most holy place one day out of the year. That was it. And the most holy place, God's presence there among the Israelites and his seat of authority, which was the Ark of the Covenant and the token of their salvation. My goodness, for Moses to let somebody put an idol on top of that never happened. Never, probably never entered Moses' mind. Joshua, the same way. Solomon, David. Solomon had all these other pagan temples that he had built for all of his wives, his, you know, and he's burning incense in there and all this stuff. He never put a carved image in the most holy place on top of the Ark of the Covenant. But Manasseh did, but it just didn't happen overnight. It was led up to. And I can clearly see that we're being led up to in Matthew 24 what Jesus called and he's quoting the book of Daniel the abomination of desolation so you have all the earthquakes famines wars everything like that false prophets and then he drops this on them. Matthew 24 verse 15 when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, 
such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Jesus wasn't, he, I, he, I guarantee you, he wasn't saying this with a big smile on his face, you know, poking Peter and saying, I was just teasing about all that. I mean, I scared you, right? No, he was dead serious about this. This seems to be, uh, number one, probably the most mysterious thing in the Bible. Number two, I think one of the most important things to ever happen. I mean, look at the language again. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of this world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The abomination of desolation, when it takes place, I believe is going to change everything. Have you heard that commercial? And you say, which one? All of them. You're hearing things and you're not paying attention to them. And that's the way commercials like to work. They like to work subliminally, you know, underneath your consciousness. But they say things like, this changes everything. You know, a new world, a new era, a new day, a new dawn, a new, you know, great awakening, whatever. All of these words, I believe, are talking about this event, the abomination of desolation. Let's isolate it. Look at Matthew 24, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Here's my problem. And don't get me wrong. I don't have a problem with anything in the Bible. I just don't understand everything in the Bible. We all see through a glass darkly. All of us. I can remember Dr. Jack Van Impey back in the early 90s when I was a young pastor. On Saturday nights, I would stay up at 11 o'clock and watch Jack Van Impey and Rexella. Here's Dr. Jack Van Impey. And they would give the news, sort of like the Watchman broadcast. And he, he sold a series of video cassettes called Daniel Unsealed. And I'm going, oh, wow, man, that ought to be great. And I got to thinking about it. Daniel is, I mean, let's look at it. Daniel, and we're going to read the scripture in a minute. Daniel sealed. It's the 27th book of the Old Testament. Revelation is its counterpart. It's the 27th book of the New Testament. And just like in Jeremiah 32, you have when God told Jeremiah to have it written up, the land that he was buying from his cousin, he said there was to be a copy of the book that was sealed and a copy of the book that was unsealed. And that's what we have. We have Revelation, which specifically says that the words are not sealed up in it, but Daniel specifically says these words are sealed up until the time of the end. Now, I read Revelation 5 and 6 where the book is being unsealed and I didn't see Dr. Jack Van Impey's name in there anywhere. So if you spent $49.95 plus $10 for shipping and handling, to Dr. Jack Van Impey back in 1993, you wasted your money because he is not allowed. He's not, he's not Christ. Only Christ can unseal the book. That's, that's what I know. And I love the book of Daniel. I love Daniel as a guy. I do. I love this guy. One of my heroes in the Bible. To be sitting there petting lions? Are you kidding me? Okay, and the things that he did, he is a role model for a young man, a boy growing up. I love Daniel, but I read his book and I'm just going, uh, there's things here. You know, Daniel chapters one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't seem to have too much problem with. I mean, after all, I think the secret 
the big secret of masonry is in Daniel chapter 2. I think it is. I think that's what it is. But when you get into Daniel 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I mean, we've got some pretty serious stuff here that even the language syntax in some cases doesn't make sense. Like in Daniel 9, um, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. I don't really understand that too awfully well. And a lot of people don't. Some people say, oh, that's easy. But I just believe that the understanding of what Daniel was saying is still sealed up. We can't, we can't see it yet. Um, and I have biblical proof for that. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but since I've already said it, then I will go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Right now, he's not revealed. And anybody that says, I know who the beast is. No, you don't. He's, you're wrong. He's not been revealed yet. The book is still sealed, still in God's right hand. There will come a time when he gives it to Jesus, the savior of mankind. The lamb has prevailed to open the book. And he'll unseal all these things. And then I believe Daniel would be unsealed and the understanding of it. But right now, all I can do is guess. But I'm going to try to make it a pretty good guess. Okay? And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I've been wrong before. Wrong Mike is my name. Okay? It's what you can call me. Uh, some people do. Okay? And I'll easily admit it. But let's look at things that God said were abominable to him. And that because of how abominable it is, he leaves. Meaning, he makes where the, whatever place he was in, he leaves it desolate. That's what the phrase abomination of desolation means. That it is something that is so horrible and so bad that God physically left. Remember Ichabod. What does it mean? The glory is departed. What does that mean? It means that the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen by the Philistines and God's presence, and I think this has something to do with it, God's presence could not be with his people because his throne was taken by Dagon and the Philistines. So God literally could not be in their presence and here is Phineas's wife as she's drawing her last breath in this world giving birth to Phineas's son, who she calls Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed because the Ark of the Covenant had been taken. All right? So let's go back, Matthew 24, 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. And I think the holy place then would be the most holy place I don't call it the Holy of Holies because this book doesn't call it the Holy of Holies. It calls it the most holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was 10 cubits by 10 cubits. I think it was 10 cubits tall. But anyway, it was there. And that's the holy place. There's something going to be in the holy place where only God is allowed to be. And he says, whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, I don't. I'm trying to. But you have to admit, some things in Daniel that I just can't, I can't figure it out. And I don't think I have to right now. But when it happens, it'll be like, 
Oh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's what we'll do. He's referring, of course, to a couple places in the book of Daniel, Daniel 11, 31. And arms shall stand on his part. Stop right here. I don't, that's language I don't really understand. And arms shall stand on his part. Arms like, I guess, like spears and swords and things like that. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. That I think I get. And shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now again, the meaning of those words. And he's referenced here the sanctuary the daily sacrifice, the abomination that maketh desolate. Something happens and God says, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here. You, you can't pray to me. I won't hear you. I'm not going to talk to you. Sort of like Saul ended up. Remember Saul, King Saul? He ended up being desolate. Why? God took his Holy Spirit from him and an evil spirit beat him to death until the day he killed himself. Then in Daniel chapter 12, and I heard, but I understood not. That would be me. Then said I, O oh my Lord, and let me stop right here. I'm not the first person in the world to hear from God and have no idea what he was meaning. Samuel was called, what, four times? The first three times he had no clue who it was. He kept going to Eli. Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, was told, hey, you and your wife Elizabeth, you're going to have a baby. But he didn't understand it. He didn't see it for what it was. You had the entire nation of Israel with Jesus the Messiah right in front of them. And they don't understand it. They don't comprehend it. And some things, I just don't... And maybe you're gifted. Maybe you are. But I just don't understand it. I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. The words are, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall, future tense, understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there should be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. In other words, God said, Daniel, don't worry about it. For now, just don't worry about it. Write it down like I said it. When it happens, you'll get it. And I think Jesus, going back to verse 15 in Matthew 24, whoso readeth, let him understand. I think there probably will come a time, undoubtedly come a time, when all of God's people will go, that's it. That's it. But for now, it, it is sealed. So, since Daniel's words are sealed up and we can't really draw a picture, make a movie, do some computer graphics of what exactly the abomination of desolation really is, then let's rely upon the rest of the scripture, the scriptures of truth, Daniel said, and let's look at things that according to the Bible were a abominations labeled so by God. If God looked at something and said, that's an abomination, then write it down. It's an abomination to God. Unlike most preachers nowadays 
who've changed God's Word so much in their preaching and their sermons and their teachings and their podcasts and everything else that they say right is wrong and wrong is right. But if God says it's abominable, it's an abomination. And if it's so bad that God literally will not be in the presence of it, then you know that it's really, 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 really bad. This is bad. How bad? Really, really, really bad. The worst bad ever. And we're not going to say, oh, that's not bad. We're going to say, that's bad. All right? Now, so let's look for clues. For, for right now, we're going to look in the rest of the scripture for clues. Now, we've mentioned the sanctuary of strength tabernacle, the temple, God's dwelling place, the throne that he sits on. You know, I mentioned Dagon and the Ark of the Covenant, and I, I've said it, I believe that for every prophecy and every doctrine, God draws a picture for us in the Bible of what it looks like. And we look and go, oh, look at the pretty pictures. I get it now. And I think the Philistines, we go all the way back to um, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 5. Uh, they took it in chapter 4 of 1 Samuel. They stole the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Israelites brought it out and said, it will save us. It, uh, I'm sorry, God's not an it. They said it will save us and God let them get beat and they came running back with their tail between their legs and they lost the Ark of the Covenant. When Eli heard about it, remember he fell backward. He heard that his sons got killed. That was hard enough. But when he heard that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, that killed him. He literally could not handle the Ark of the Covenant being taken. Can you imagine? It would be like it would be like us finding out that Jesus got killed again and he's not ever coming back. If you heard that and believed it, that would be the end of my life. I wouldn't live anymore. Okay? So we have that as a picture. And in 1 Samuel 5, the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Dagon, you think of Dagon as the Antichrist. He's half beast, half man, like Revelation 13. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Both. So Dagon wants that Ark. He wants God's throne. I want to sit on it. I want to be in charge. I want to be the boss. I want to be like the most high. And what happened? Dagon is fallen, is fallen. He fell twice, didn't he? First time partial fulfillment, second time perfect fulfillment. All right. So that in itself is an abomination. And did the Philistines do well because they had the Ark of the Covenant? Did they prosper? No, they all ended up with <coughs> hemorrhoids, emeralds, sores blowing out blood, right? All over their body. Ugh. And so they said, get this thing away from us. And the, it was the five Philistine lords, five, number for death, right? Like the five kings in Joshua 10. So. We ask, again, ask the question, are there things in the Bible that when they happen, like with Manasseh, like with Dagon, when God, when that happens, and the Ark of the Covenant is taken, and then the woman has the baby, now the son is revealed, and she calls him Ichabod, the glory is departed. It's a picture, I believe, of the abomination of desolation. I think God gave us a preview of, not the whole movie, but a, just a preview of what it looks like. 
And there are other things in the Bible that God said, if you do this, I'll leave. If you do this, I will pack up, I will move out, I am not going to stay in the presence of this. Does God do that? You better believe He does. What is it that could trip God's trigger to make Him get up, walk out, never to return? Well, how about worshiping the Queen of Heaven? Jeremiah 44, verse 19. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Now look in verse 20. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind? Stop right here. You think God was out that day fishing and he didn't know that you were worshiping and praying to other gods? He didn't know that your covetousness, which is as idolatry, Paul says, had taken over you and you think God is going to overlook that? And he says, I'm not. Because look at what he says then in verse 22. 22 is the number for revelation, right? So that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed, therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Now stop and think about what he means. He says, I caught you. I caught you in bed with another God and I'm leaving. I am not going to stand for this. I'm packing my stuff. I'm going to walk out and you're going to be without my presence, which means I'm not paying your bills. I'm not taking care of you. I mean, you think of a husband and wife, right? Husband comes home, finds a wife, whatever. And he says, that's it. I'm done. I'm walking out of here. I'm not ever coming back. Your abominations have brought this desolation. And think of what that word means. We use the word desolate, and the Bible does too, to mean a place so barren, so wild, that, and so harsh, the climate so harsh that nobody lives there. Think of Antarctica. There's a continent down there, and you say, well, people live down there. Yeah, under very special, unique conditions, but they don't farm down there, they don't fish down there, they don't shoot elk and antelope down there, they don't grow corn down there, nothing. There's no hermit living by himself at the South Pole with a house and a little garden and nothing. That's not possible down there. It is a land desolate and cannot be lived in. And that's what he's referring to. When the abomination of desolation takes place, God leaves. And now there's a, you know, an argument over whether the Holy Ghost is taken from the earth or not. You know, I, I don't understand everything. I know Israel is going to have the Holy Ghost. So I don't think the earth is going to be completely Holy Ghostless. Okay? But I do believe that as far as the Gentile world is concerned, God is parting company just like he did with Israel in 1 Samuel 5, and like he's doing here. Because of the abominations which ye have committed, therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as it is this day. So, he made it clear as crystal. You worshipped the Queen of Heaven. You poured out drink offerings to her. You made cakes. What is the Eucharist? 
It's a cake. It is. Now, it's not like a birthday cake or German chocolate. I like German chocolate better than birthday cakes. But it's not like that. It is literally a cake of dough, unleavened dough or whatever. And they patted it out, cooked it on both sides, put it or put it in the oven, brought it out. And they said, here, holy queen of heaven, here is our cake offering to you. We offer this to you for, to bless us, which is exactly the doctrine of the Catholic Church. I mean, take a look at this painting. Here is Jesus, and I guess God, I'm guessing, and I'm assuming that's God there because there's a dove in the middle, so that would be the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, putting a crown on Mary, who is adorned in purple like mystery Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abomination who's the spirit behind the abominations that would cause the desolation to take place mystery Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth she's the one behind it all she's the spirit that when her spirit takes over God says I'm leaving. I'm not staying here with that woman. You understand now? God says that that is an abomination. And there are churches that are called Mary, Queen of Heaven, Catholic Church. To them, she is literally the Queen of Heaven. Why did they name her that? I don't know, if not to fulfill Bible prophecy. They actually call Mary the mother of the church. And, and here's what I know about the architecture of your average Roman Catholic church. They're designed to be a womb, literally. You go in to the door, you're in the sanctuary, and you stand in this spot called the, you know, the transept, where the transept and the nave meet. I've talked about this before, and you receive the cake that they made for the Queen of Heaven, the food that they sacrificed in front of an idol, which Acts 15 told us not to eat. Don't partake of that. That's an abomination. Don't do it. Okay? So that's what they do in that one spot. And you are regenerated. So you, now you come out of the door of the church. Now you're born again for a while in their eyes. Because they don't have salvation that lasts very long. And this idea about Mary being the mother of the church, I'm not making that up. Pope Paul said it. He goes back. We have to go back before Benedict. John Paul II, John Paul I, to Pope Paul, 1960, 1963. I'm going to show you something in a minute. This article, everyone has a mother. Yes, the mother who gave them birth in the physical order of life. But Christian believers have another mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Stop right here. That is not, no siree, that is not what my Bible says. My Bible says... Galatians 4, verse 26, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Not Mary. Jerusalem, heaven, is our mother. She is whom we were born the second time from. Some people are born of hell. We're born of heaven. And I'm not going to read all of this, but this, this was pronounced as dogma by Pope Paul and Francis, the talking Pope. St. Paul VI declared Mary as mother of the church. Pope Francis in 2018 reinvigorated the title by proclaiming the Monday after Pentecost as the memorial of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of the church. 
through scripture and tradition, we see clearly how Mary has been mother of the church. Well, I would say through tradition, but not a scripture. Scripture denies their doctrine, their idea. Mary is not the queen of heaven. She is not the mother of the church. And she's not the mother of God. Mater Dei. She's not. The spirit that they're referring to is none other than mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So let's say you were visiting uh, your uncle Johnny Polanski up in Chicago. And your uncle Johnny says, yeah, we're going to go to the Catholic church over here. And we're going to have do the prayer and have the priest bless us. And then we'll come back and we'll have some brewskis, all right? So you go up there to Chicago and you go in this Catholic church and you see this. Yes, that is Mary, the mother of the Catholic Church, the Queen of Heaven, sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. I would, I would just, you know, I'm not God, not close, but I know what God said, and I'm pretty sure this qualifies for being something that God says, I'm looking at this, Manasseh did it, other people have tried it, and I'm leaving. There is no way in the world that God is going to sustain His presence with a statue of the Scarlet Woman, who they say is Mary, and it's not, the statue of the Scarlet Woman sitting on God's seat of authority. Sitting in the place where God administers His grace to us from heaven. That's what the Ark of the Covenant represents. It represents Christ's blood being the atonement sprinkled upon the mercy seat of God so that God then can justify all of us sinners by His grace. And it's done so with Him sitting upon the everlasting Ark of the Covenant that is in heaven. Revelation, I think it's Revelation 11. The Ark of the Covenant was seen. John saw it up in heaven. We know that's God's throne. We know that's God's mercy seat. And the Catholic Church declares that Mary is just as equal as Jesus Christ when it comes to redemption and salvation and the administration of God's grace. That, my friend, is an abomination that would cause God to make that place desolate, saying, I will not abide here. But you know what? It's really not the only thing that the Catholic Church has done that would cause God to just get up and walk out if He was ever there to begin with. And I'll show you that in a minute. I got some big things in here to show you. Things I've known about for years. That I've just kind of held on in the back of my mind. I may have mentioned it a few times before, but I'm going to draw it into this context today. There are other things in the scripture that God says, I'm not going to abide this. I'm not going to live in this house. I am not going to maintain a presence here. If you continue on this way, being this way, doing these things, I will leave. Job chapter 15 verse 34. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate. What's a congregation? A church, a church full of hypocrites, 
Matthew 23, Jesus defined what all makes hypocrites. You bind people with heavy burdens, but you won't lift a finger to do anything. You put burdens upon people that are so hard and so difficult, you make it practically impossible for anybody to be saved. But you yourself, you're ex sort of like Congress with Obamacare, right? Oh, Obamacare, that's for the American, well, that's not for us congressmen. What are you kidding? <laughs> we don't want that insurance. That's, a, that's junk. It's worthless. We don't do that. But, well, we make you do it, but we don't want it. We don't want anything to do with it. Okay? So, congregation of hypocrites. God literally leaves a church. He withdraws his presence. Now, there has to be a replacement spirit in there, right? So then comes in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul said, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. It will easily replace, whenever God leaves, don't worry, because nature abhors a vacuum. When God leaves and his presence leaves, there's plenty of spirits that will show up to replace him. Plenty of dogmas, plenty of doctrine, plenty of traditions, plenty of lies, plenty of abominations to fill a place when God leaves. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. They conceive mischief and bring forth vanity, and their belly prepareth deceit. The language of the King James Bible is stunning here. It's stunning the whole thing. But the, look at what he's saying. They conceive mischief. Well, that's a baby being conceived, isn't it? Remember what I told you about the mother of the church and the Catholic churches are wombs? You have to, you can't receive any of the graces of the Catholic church outside of the Catholic church. They conceive mischief, bring forth as like a child vanity. That's the, it's the Antichrist. Their belly prepareth deceit. A child is going to be born. A man of sin, a son of perdition is going to be revealed whose every word is a lie, a deceit. Psalm 34, 21, evil shall slay the wicked and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. See, I like to give the good with the bad, right? The bad is the evil things that people do. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. When there is so much hatred in this, war, in this country, for Bible Christianity. That's to their destruction. Remember, Jesus said, they hate you, yeah. They hated me first. Don't worry, I'm with you. If the world hates you, rejoice. Because they hated me too. So, just join with me and everything will be okay. And I promise you, like he said, None of them that trust in him, none of them that put their trust in Jesus Christ will ever be desolate. God, Jesus is telling us, since I'm in your throne, in your heart, abiding in the tabernacle that I made, if I'm in there, don't worry. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. Psalm 69. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That's a prophecy of Christ on the cross. So he says in verse 22, Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened, that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate, 
and let none dwell in their tents. Stop right here. Now he's explaining what it means to be desolate. The fact that nobody can live there, especially God. Remember the teaching I did several years ago, and I'm going to bring that back up again into this context where dragons live. God showed me through a, just, I got curious one day about dragons in the Bible and I wanted to study it out. And I found out the Bible is like a Boy Scout trail guide showing you, see this creature over here? This is where it lives. This is where it grows. This is what it eats. This is what it thrives on. See these places over here? You'll never find dragons over in this place. They don't like to live there. They won't live there. They'll leave, but they do like to live here. This is what we're talking about. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So you understand what he's saying here. That those whom God has left, they had literally are living in utter desolation. And God is saying, and remember, this is a prophecy, Christ on the cross, because they gave him vinegar to drink. Who did? The Jews. Israel. And did God leave them? Yeah. Temporarily. But he left them. He said, I'm not going to dwell with them. I'm going to let their habitation become a snare unto them. I'm going to let it be a trap. I'm going to let their doctrine destroy them. The deceit that's in their heart and all these things they invented, they got from the Babylonians and the Sumerians and the Canaanites and all those evil Kabbalah doctrines. I'm going to let that destroy them. And their house is going to be a desolate, empty house. Nothing in the world worse than an empty house. When I was a boy, my favorite place in the world was not Disneyland, although I liked theme parks. It was Grandma's house. And after Grandma died, and Grandpa, and they're not in that house, I took my camera, walked through that house, videoing the camera as a re reminder to me of the days that used to be. But that house has been sold. Other people moved into it. They took out everything that was in there, replaced it with their stuff. It's not the same anymore. You understand what I'm getting at, right? Now, Psalm 74, 3. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations. Even all that the enemy hath done wickedly where? In the sanctuary. That's what he said. What is the sanctuary? You see the picture I have here. Psalm 143, 4 says, Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me, and my heart within me is desolate. What's the heart? It's the throne of God. The four chambers, the four living creatures, the four beasts, the two lungs are the seven spirits of God because there's seven brachial trees, brachial branches that grow out from the mouth and go in and give us light, give the body life. The spirit is down with us while Jesus and the Father are up here in the head. Isn't that, isn't that neat? And you got three holes where the air goes in and comes out. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? And that, I love this stuff, right? So... What are we talking about now? Are we talking about a building that they're going to build somewhere and they're going to put an idol in it? That's been done. That's been done. That's been done millions of times over, all over the earth. There's buildings everywhere in every corner of the earth where they got idols in it and they worship. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about the real sanctuary which is the house that Jesus himself built. That's what I believe. 
2 Thessalonians 2, He is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing Himself that He is God. To me, the only possible realism of what the temple of God is, is the house that He built, the human body. Isaiah 6, verse 9, And He said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Isaiah 10 verse 3, And what will ye do in the day of visitation, and in the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will ye flee for help, and where will ye leave your glory? So we're getting clues here from these verses. Remember, God didn't stick all of his doctrine in one spot in the Bible. He spread it out. Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept. So we search the scriptures as the Bereans. And we find out what the nature of God and what, what moves him, what causes him to leave a place. What does it mean when he says desolate? And here he's describing these people, they refuse to hear me with their ears. They refuse to see me with their eyes. They refuse to read this book and believe it. Their hearts are fat so that they have no care, no concern about God and his kingdom whatsoever. So God said, all these cities and all these houses that you have, too bad because nobody's going to live in them. That's what he means by making something desolate. A woman's womb can be desolate when she can have and bear no children. Sad, but it happens. It's the same with the house of God. Who's the man that we're talking about? The man would be Jesus Christ. The pre we already read the verse, right? Where Jesus, God told us, that he said, those who put their trust in me, don't worry. You'll never be desolate. I'll never leave the dwelling place that you have, you've let me in. I stood at the door, knocked, you opened the door. I come in, sup with you. I fellowship with you every day. I'm living in you. I'm the new man inside of you, right? And he said, I'll never leave that. I, don't worry. I promise I won't leave you. What a great promise. I live, literally live by that every day. Okay? So when the man, Christ, leaves, now it's desolate. Something happens to make God leave his own house. Now, Isaiah 13 is a prophecy about Babylon. Isaiah 13 is something I've covered several times before. And he mentions here that Babylon is a place that he's going to lay desolate. And in Isaiah 13, remember I mentioned where dragons live? This is what led me to it, was Isaiah 13. Because I'm reading Isaiah 13, I find out when God makes something desolate, that's when the beasts move in. Now, and I know some of you don't really see eye to eye with me on this, but just kind of bear with me a little bit. When I talk about UFOs and aliens and extraterrestrials, you understand I don't think that there are Martians living on Mars, okay? But I do believe that there are spirits 
that live in the heavens and beneath the earth, and they're coming. But they haven't, they haven't shown up yet. They haven't, they haven't made it here. They, I mean, they keep, I do believe they make appearances and people see them in different forms. Every story that you've heard about somebody seeing a ghost, a Wendigo, when I go to Fargo and talk to the people up there, some of them are Native Americans, First Nations, and they remember the stories they were told about the Wendigo, which is kind of like the boogeyman for us white Christian people, whatever. But they all have these appearances. These devils make appearances in this world every now and then. Can they live inside people? Oh, yeah. Do they? Yeah. Are certain houses literally inhabited by spirits? Jesus himself said it. So I believe it. And I believe that they make different appearances based upon what they look like. Some look like wolves. Some look like dogs. Some look like little gray, big-headed children-looking things. Some look like tall, white people. Some are furry with hair all over them like a satyr. That's what I believe. And the fact that they haven't come and just taken over the whole earth is because God's people who just believe the Bible and believe the Word of God and live by it, well, we're still here with this book everywhere we go. And we have Jesus living in us everywhere we go. So, there's a reason why they haven't just showed up and moved in, taken over the planet Earth. It's because we're standing in their way. But I do believe there's coming a time when the beasts are going to show up. When the dragons, they're going to move in. Isaiah 13. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows. Think of 1 Thessalonians 5. Shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger. Why? To lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. That's Acts chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, Revelation chapter 6. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Think about what I said about Jesus leaving. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove. That's Revelation 6 and the sixth seal shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Boy, God is mad. He is totally upset with this world. Aren't you? I am. I'm very angry, very disgusted at this world that I live in. I don't like it anymore. I want to go. And we're going. Look at the language he's here. And he's linking it up with these prophecies we see in the book of Revelation, right? The unsealing of the book. So, God says, when I lay the land desolate, something's going to show up. Because he says in verse 19, in Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Does anybody live in Sodom and Gomorrah? Not anymore. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But the wild beast of the desert shall lie there. Is there more than one kind of beast? Is there just little furry little animals in the woods? 
No, there's devils. What Ezekiel called living creatures in Ezekiel 1, John called beasts in Revelation 4. So that's what they are. Wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate, look at it, desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. You've seen it, right? An old abandoned house, nobody lives there anymore. Does that house remain as pristine as the day that it was first built? No. Decay, second law of thermodynamics. Everything corrupts into a lesser state, breaks down. It's the way of this world, it's the vanity. So when God leaves because of the abomination that's there, when God leaves, the beasts move in, the owls, and we're not just talking about we're talking about devils. Satyrs. That's used in a couple places in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word sa'ir, something like that. And in one place in the King James, it's actually translated devils. Now, remember what I said about the Vatican? You know, the people who get all mixed up on who their mother is. They think their mother is Mary, but it's not, well, well, it is Mystery Babylon. That, that is their mother. That, they're, they're right. That, that's Mystery Babylon, the great. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And all you need to know is to know a little bit about the Bible. And then your eyes will be open and you'll see it. Because guess what? In St. Peter's Basilica, that word basilica is from a Greek word, basileus, it means like a, a, where a king lives. In St. Peter's Basilica, where the Pope does the Mass from, okay, oh, there's tons of symbolism there. I don't have time to get into it. But, you know, where the Pope stands to have those high Masses that they do in the Vatican, St. Peter's Square, St. Peter's Church. He's standing in this one spot and there's these four like windy pillars. That's called a baldacchino. That's an Italian word. And there's this roof over it and it's got these four twisty columns that hold it up. And guess what's on those columns? Satyrs. There they are. This is the Baldacchino altar covering, St. Peter's Basilica, and on the bottom, the four square foundations of each one of those twisty posts that are called Salomnic pillars. Below the bees, those are satyrs. They are satyrs. The, the Catholic Church says they're satyrs. The guy that designed it put satyrs in a desolate house. Exactly where God said they would be. Is God ever wrong? No. And he told Isaiah, Isaiah, write this down because they're going to see it. My people are going to know what I, that I, what I say is true. Even though... In Isaiah's day, none of this stuff had ever happened. When Isaiah wrote it down, had not occurred yet. Now, I can't remember when this Baldacchino was designed and built. It's been a few hundred years ago. They put satyrs in the desolate house where God says, if they're there, it's because I'm not there. 
to all the Roman Catholics who would ever listen to me, I don't hate you. I hate your religion because it keeps you in perpetual bondage. You are never free from sin as long as they rule over you with their masses and their penances and the indulgences, the money that they want to cheat you out of for saying a mass in somebody's name to get them out of purgatory. That's a scam. It's not in the Bible. And I would like for you to be free from that. You can, did you know that you can pray directly to God through Jesus Christ? You don't have to confess your sins to a priest, ever. You don't have to. That was never in the Bible anywhere. You confess your sins to God and He will make you free. And there's lizards there. Literally dragons. There's dragons in what is supposed to be the house of God. So is Isaiah 13, is it right? Did it tell the truth? Absolutely it did. I, I got to add this in. I just get fascinated when I start seeing symbols of things. This is what's directly above the Baldacchino where the satyrs and the dragons are. Notice the blue area with the stars in them. Those are seven pointed stars. Guess how many there are? I'll just tell you. There's 32 of them, which means, and I've dealt with this number so many times before, you should get it by now, which means the 33rd person is the one standing underneath all of them. The man who refers to himself as Holy Father. That phrase is used one time in the whole Bible. It's in John 17, in Jesus did not refer to Francis or Benedict or Pope Paul or John Paul or anybody else for that matter. He was referring to his heavenly father. It is blasphemy for a man to take the title of holy father. It is what Lucifer said, I will be like the most high. Do you think that all of this qualifies as an abomination? that will cause God to make that house desolate. Absolutely. But as I said, that's not the only thing that they've done. The Vatican. 1963. I've had an idea. By the way, we're now celebrating it's close to January 20th. We're now celebrating 12 years of the Watchman video broadcast. Glory be to God always for what he has done. But this guy here, I'm not much. And to all the people that have followed this ministry for these past 12 years, God bless you. I love you. Okay? But I've had it in my mind for years since I heard about this. I knew something was unique about the year 1963. When you think about it, in America, 1963, Supreme Court, for the first time ever, said God cannot come into our schools. They, the Supreme Court, banned having prayers in all public schools across the nation. See, I was born in 66. I never had a time when I stood up in a public school classroom and said prayers. Never. That was after, that was before my time. 1963, the assassination of a president first time it's ever been filmed or photographed, right? 
and the symbolism there, well, but then something else happened. I heard a rumor, and I wasn't sure if it's true. A Jesuit priest by the name of Malachi Martin, he had written several books. He was an insider in the Vatican, knew what had gone on there. Now, he was a man that was in love with his church. I'll give him that. And I've said it before, Jesuit priests, smartest people in the world. Why do they pray to statues? I'll never understand that. You can be smart, but not know God. So I'm not saying the man's a saint by any means whatsoever. But he wrote so many things exposing what was going on in the Vatican. Books like, um, I can't remember one where he's talking about the installment of a pope. Another one, The Keys to This Blood, about Pope John Paul II. Then he writes The Windswept House. And he writes it, he says, in the form of a novel. And he calls it faction. He says, I write it as fiction. And he said it's 80% fact, 15 to 20% fiction. He changes names and some dates. But the events are real. And in the very beginning of the book, The Windswept House, this is what Malachi Martin said he knows what happened. St. Paul's Cathedral, and a, which is where the conclave meets. You know, it's St. Paul's Cathedral where Michelangelo did all the painting where, you know, you have God touching Adam's finger, all that stuff. St. Paul's is where the conclave meets, where the cardinals meet to vote on the Pope. One of, like the second most sacred place in the Catholic Church. So St. Paul's Cathedral and a Catholic Church somewhere in Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina is on the 33rd parallel. Okay, I think they chose it for that reason. Malachi Martin didn't say that. I'm saying it. I think they chose that church for that reason. By telephone, 1963, a joint ritual took place. Here's what Malachi Martin said. 1963, the enthronement of the fallen archangel Lucifer was effected within the Roman Catholic citadel on June 29, 1963. A fitting date for the historic promise about to be fulfilled as the principal agents of this ceremonial well knew. Satanist tradition had long predicted that the time of the prince would be ushered in at the moment when a pope would take the name of the Apostle Paul. That requirement, the signal that the availing time had begun, had been accomplished just eight days before with the election of the latest Peter in the line. And that's when Windswept House, page 7. And he goes on to describe the ceremony. And I will just... It involved a dog. And a girl child. And they desecrated the altar. That dog. And that girl. Satanists and Freemasons within the Vatican. According to the Catholic Church, no priest is, you're not allowed to be a Freemason and be a Catholic, period, according to their rules, right? But Malachi Martin said that the Vatican is just overrun with Freemasons and avowed Satanists. Remember a few years ago, the controversy that practically through Benedict caused him to retire and step down because of the homosexual scandal that was going on in the Vatican where all these cardinals and priests were going to these gay brothels and doing these things inside the Vatican. Okay, listen, that house is desolate. 
It is, as Malachi Martin says, a wind-swept house. God does not dwell there. Ezekiel 33, verse 23. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for an inheritance. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, which was against the law. God said that the blood was the life thereof. And lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood. And shall ye possess the land? You stand upon your sword, ye work, look at the word, abomination. And you defile everyone his neighbor's wife, and shall ye possess the land? Say thou thus unto them, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely they that are in the wastes shall fall by the sword. And him that is in the open field, look at what he said, will I give to the beasts to be devoured. And they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence, for I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord. When I have laid, here it is, the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. And he's talking about they pray to idols. In Ezekiel 14, the elders of Israel come to Ezekiel and they say, inquire the Lord for, for us. Go talk to God for us and find out what God would say to us. And God said, should I talk to them? Ezekiel, you can't see this, but I can. I can see in their heart. They've got idols in their heart. They had already committed in their personal life an abomination that caused desolation. God said, I left their house a long time ago. And should I speak to them? Should I give them my word? No. I will speak to them according to their abominations, according to their idols, which they have in their heart. In other words, God said, I'll just let them believe lies. They have no interest in serving me and living for me and believing the truth. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to say their house is desolate and I'm going to let the beast come in and devour them. And I guarantee you, he's not just talking about lions and leopards and cheetahs. He's talking about devils are going to move in because the abominations caused God to leave. And he said, the land now is desolate. Jeremiah 7, verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall be no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Tophet till there be no place. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And none shall fray them away. Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. For the land shall be desolate. Look at what he says. He said, the, the people that live here, he, calls, he says the fowls of the heaven. You know, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, in this, when Jesus told the parable of the seed and the sower, he starts out by saying, you know, some of the seed fell by the wayside and the fowls of the heaven came down, devoured it. But then he said, the evil one, the wicked one, the devil, Satan. Satan, the fowls of the heaven represent these devils Satan and all of his sub-devils underneath him, that's what they represent. The fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth, where are they going to come from? Revelation 12, they fall out of heaven. In Revelation 9, they come up out of the earth, literally. These beasts are going to come because God has left the building. And he's not staying there. And he's going to give back to mankind exactly what they have coming. He said, I'm going to allow these beasts to come and just devour you. They're going to eat you. And he said, none shall fray them away. You know what that means, don't you? You know how you, get out of here, you birds. Shoo, go on out of here. Okay. 
God said, they're not leaving. Remember in Genesis 9 where God said, I put a fear of man in these beasts? Here he says, it ain't going to work. They're not afraid of you. They're going to devour you. That's, that's what he means. When the abominations are done that causes the desolation to happen, the beasts and the devil show up. Oh, he said, then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of, who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Who's the bride? Us. He said, there's going to come a time you're not going to hear the church people singing. You're not going to hear the preachers preaching. You're not going to hear the Bible. Where else have you read that? Revelation 18. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of the harpers and musicians and of pipers and of trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Same thing he said about Jerusalem is the same thing he said about Babylon. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Wow, this is deep stuff. What God said about, by the way, in Revelation, he said Jerusalem is that great city, Sodom and Egypt. Jerusalem on the earth seems to have become Babylon the Great, which is similar to what has happened in a lot of the churches all across the world now. We find that in Jeremiah 9-11. And I will make Jerusalem heaps in a den of dragons and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Jeremiah 10, 22, Behold, the noise of the brute is come, and a great commotion out of the north, the north countries, the heavens, to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. So, just to make what I'm trying to lay out for you very clear, I will just stick with scripture on what I believe will be the abomination, the, the one great big abomination of all abominations that's ever been abominated on the earth. This, there's going to be one great big gigantic abomination. Jesus said the abomination of desolation, the, that one big one. I think it's Ezekiel 28, 2 Thessalonians 2, and you can see it in other places in the Bible, but I think he makes it very clear here. Ezekiel 28, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God capital G. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. And I want to say, don't mistake me 
thinking that I believed that at one time God actually ruled in the Vatican. I don't think it ever happened. But if there ever was an ounce of holiness anywhere inside the walls of Vatican City, it surely left 1963. They literally and were determined to prepare a place for Lucifer himself to sit in the chair of Peter, in the throne of God, in the Vatican. No, there's no doubt in my mind that it happened. Two, if you look at, if you look at just America before 1963 and after 1963, there's a big difference. The spirit that was unleashed I believe in 1963 is changed our whole nation's way of life from that year on and I'm a product of that generation I was born after that meaning that in my lifetime I've seen it happen those of you older than me you've seen it you've seen what life was before 63 See, I can only guess and look at TV shows and read things. You were there. You saw it. I believe that spirits were unleashed and unbound in this world that were preparing for the day, the, the big numero uno day when the abomination of desolation takes place. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God. It's exactly what Ezekiel 28 was saying, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Notice the language. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You know, when the police do a sting operation, they put men undercover inside like a drug organization or something like that, and they're there to monitor and gather evidence. Do they arrest the bosses, the drug dealers, before they sell the drugs or do they wait until after they committed the act sold the drugs or whatever it was and then they say now we're going to arrest you see the drug dealers and the mafia guy they have to be revealed first then they can be judged and that's what jesus is doing here he's going to allow the man of sin do not marvel at what you see going on around you in the wicked, wickedness of this world. It is going to get far worse. I, can't, I can barely take what's going on now. I mean, I just fold up some days. Some days I'm worthless with fear of what I see going on in this world. It is going to get much worse. It is going to get so bad that God is going to walk out and he's going to let these foul devils Satan himself the man of sin himself to be revealed and enthroned to literally rule in every heart you see Hitler had Germany 
but he didn't have all the Germans, did he? Nah, there were some people that were, they were not hiling Hitler at all. You see, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, he can't just pop up and say, I'm in charge, everybody do what I say. And everybody goes, yay, we're going to do what you say. He literally is going to sit in their heart controlling everything they say and do. Literally. 1 Corinthians 3. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, some say that they're literally going to build a temple in Jerusalem. Maybe. I don't know. But one thing I know, and I know it as much as I know anything, is that the temple of God, that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to show himself to be God in, is the body of mankind. Of that I have no doubt. And once God has said, Adios, I'm going to leave you to it, they're moving in. And it is going to be a horrible day on that day. Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know that you have your sins forgiven? I've said it before. Just knowing all the conspiracy theories doesn't qualify. Being Watching right-wing news doesn't qualify. Going to a MAGA rally does not save you. You must be born again. Ask Jesus to save you before the day occurs. Don't wait thinking you can do it afterward. That may not come. God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do here at Bethel. We thank you. I said it this morning. We never take anybody for granted. We thank you for being as much a part of this ministry as I am. God bless you all. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.